All right. So today we have Mitch Weaver tell us about mixing local and extended operators. Take it away. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Julius. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, give a, a quiver talk. I've uh, greatly benefited from uh, many of these over the years, so I'm glad to be able to finally contribute one of my own. Um, so my talk today is going to be based on ongoing work with uh, Philip Argiris, uh, my advisor here at Cincinnati, and our uh, collaborator, Matteo Latito, who uh, just started his second postdoc at Seoul National University in, in South Korea. And uh, the talk is going to have significant overlap with a paper we just put up on the archive last week. Uh, and in this paper, we really tried to kind of um, introduce and summarize uh, many of the things we've learned about uh, this uh, 2D vertex algebra occurring in 40n equals 2 SCFTs that comes about um, by mixing certain um, special local and extended operators. Um, and uh, it's going to have, uh, my talk is going to have, uh, it's going to coincide with about half of the results that uh, we lay out in this paper. But uh, my hope is that uh, I'll make up for what I don't cover by instead going over some kind of uh, foundational aspects of this story that should hopefully serve as a, a good primer on uh, the kind of full scope of uh, things we have to say there. Um, so with that, uh, let me get started. Oops. There we go. Okay, so uh, our central uh, motivations for this project kind of revolve around better understanding the relationship between two quantities which appear in these SCFTs. And the first quantity on the one hand is the associated uh, vertex operator algebra of a 40n equals 2 SCFT. And the second quantity is the, uh, the set of extended operators which can appear uh, in these theories. And so I wanna make this a bit more precise. So let me start by kind of uh, demystifying what exactly I mean by a vertex operator algebra. So whenever you hear me say VOA, you can simply take it to correspond to the chiral half of a 2D CFT, which means that there's some collection of local operators labeled by some uh, Z insertion point. And these local operators depend on this Z insertion point in such a way that their correlation functions are always meromorphic in Z, which is to say they just have, have no branch cuts. Uh, the second thing this means is um, uh, uh, that's involved in, the, in, the, in the, the definition of a VOA is that there's a, a, a conserve a 2D stress tensor, which I'll call T throughout the talk. And T organizes all of the local operators into virasoro primaries and descendants. And it's also important for me to mention up front that whenever we don't have this second condition, so whenever we don't have a 2D stress tensor, we call the resulting structure just a vertex algebra, or it's also known as a chiral algebra in the literature. Okay, so now I can say a couple more specific things about uh, these VOAs, which occur in the 40 equals to CFTs. Um, and first of all, this uh, uh, story starts uh, in 2013 in this uh, very nice paper by these six authors, where in this paper they showed um, that within every unitary 40n equals 2 SCFT, um, uh, uh, there is an associated VOA. And one of the main reasons uh, uh, people like studying it is because it turns out that the 2D VOA actually contains a great deal of information about the 4D theory, and it contains so much information that it can potentially provide a unique characterization of these SCFTs. And since 2013, there's been numerous applications uh, which, for which the VOA has been used, um, where we've tried to kind of learn more about, about the 40 theory. And here are three kind of example uh, applications. So given the utility of the VOA or the sort of capability it has in describing um, uh, aspects of the ambient sort of 40 theory, it's somewhat reasonable to go looking for new structures related to it, because odds are, if you can find such a new structure, you may end up subsequently finding out something new about the 40 theory. And so today, precisely what I'm going to do is show you that um, uh, such a structure exists. Uh, but what I'm not going to tell you about is what are the potential consequences uh, for 40 physics that uh, come about from the existence of this structure. So that'll have to uh, wait for perhaps my next cover talk. OK, so now I want to. Uh, uh, mention a very uh, a key feature of the VOA. And to do this, I'm going to have to set up a coordinate system that I'm going to uh, constantly refer to throughout the talk. And the main reason I'm doing this is because, you know, we're in a 40 theory, and we're going to be talking about uh, this theory that lives on uh, a sort of uh, 2D plane. And so we're kind of breaking all the symmetries down to uh, those which uh, preserve the plane. So it's just really useful to kind of just set up a coordinate system. Um, that's natural. And a natural coordinate system is to uh, uh, use the following complex light -like concordant system um, uh, in Minkowski space, where x plus and minus are going to span uh, uh, the Tx2 plane, and orthogonal to that is going to sit a Euclidean 2 plane, which is spanned by x3 and x4. 
And I'm going to label points in uh, this Euclidean two plane by complex conjugate coordinates z and z bar. And I'm going to also uh, commonly refer to uh, uh, this Euclidean two plane as the VOA plane. And we'll see why throughout the talk. Okay. So the key feature of the VOA is that it's identified by passing the cohomology of a particular nilpotent supercharge, which I'll call T plus. And if the sentence doesn't mean anything to you, uh, this is precisely what I'm going to uh, review uh, uh, in a moment, so don't worry. But there are two major consequences uh, that come about from this key feature. The first of which is that passing to the uh, cohomology of, of T plus picks out the set of 40 local operators, which are annihilated by T plus. These are the so-called sure operators, which I'll denote by uh, uh, O sub S. And the second consequence is that we can take a, sure, a local sure operator at the origin, and when we translate it in a very particular way, what you find is that their correlation functions only depend meromorphically on their Z insertions. And we can state this second uh, uh, fact uh, in an equivalent way by saying that sure, oper sure operators satisfy an additional symmetry constraint, which says that their del Z bar derivative is just zero. Okay, so now I can tell you what our central questions are. So our first central question is, can we find extended operators, which are also annihilated by T plus in the same way that the sure operators are annihilated by T plus? And secondly, um, if one is true, we want to know what properties do the correlation functions of these extended operators satisfy. And in particular, we want to know if they satisfy any additional symmetry constraints. And so let me tell you what the answers to these questions are. So the answer to the first question is yes. We can construct extended operators, which are annihilated by T plus, and we can construct them in a sort of systematic fashion uh, via the so-called descent procedure, uh, which tells us that for every sure operator, uh, we can uh, construct a corresponding set of extended operators, which I'm calling uh, EN here, where N labels the world volume dimension of, uh, of the extended operator. And uh, the descent procedure sort of by its nature, uh, uh, these extent means these, these extended operators are going to end up being um, kind of just world volume integrals of certain super descendants of these sure operators. And I'll show you uh, uh, what this means in detail in uh, the latter part of the talk. But the answer to the second question is uh, yes, their correlation functions do satisfy uh, an additional symmetry constraint, which says that when I take one of these extended operators and I translate it again in a very particular way in the VOA plane, you find that their correlation functions are also only meromorphic uh, uh, in Z. Okay, so I haven't told you anything about the geometry of these extended operators, so this uh, answer to the second question might seem a bit cryptic. So let me now give you a kind of broad overview of our results, emphasizing the kind of um, uh, geometry of these extended operators in space-time. So first, we have the following old result, which says that the sure operators has the structure of a 2D VOA, and I'm going to call this 2D VOA chi 2D throughout the talk. And in the new results, which I'll explain today, I'm going to show how the descent procedure uh, uh, allows us to take a sure operator and construct a web of extended operators. And I'm going to only focus on the construction of three of these extended operators, which I'll call L plus, L minus, and S. And in terms of their space-time geometry, L plus corresponds to a light like line operator situated along the X plus direction. L minus corresponds to a light like line operator situated along the X minus direction. And S is a surface operator which fills the whole X plus minus plane. And what I want you to take note of is the fact that all of these ascent operators uh, intersect the VOA plane only at the origin. And so what we, what we then do is we then uh, take a configuration where I insert a, a surface operator, one a, uh, an L minus line, an L plus line, and a sure operator, and I separate them out in the VOA plane, which I'm illustrating in this picture by separating them out along this uh, axis, which parameterizes the VOA plane. Well, when we look at a correlation function of such a configuration, we find that it's, again, uh, meromorphic uh, uh, and only dependent on their Z insertion points. And so uh, what this means is that these extended operators are sort of behaving like local operators in the sense that when we insert them into the 40 space time, it corresponds to the insertion of new local operators into the, into the 2D VOA. And what we find is when uh, uh, these sort of extended operators mix with the sure operators, the resulting structure is that of a vertex algebra, at least. So it could have more structure, uh, although I'm not willing uh, to make such a claim uh, from what we uh, now know. 
But throughout the talk, it should hopefully also become apparent uh, uh, that the vertex algebra is a universal construction in the sense that if you have the VOA, then you also have uh, the vertex algebra, OK? So now let me give a, a brief outline of what I'm going to um, uh, go over for the rest of the talk. So first, uh, I'm going to review uh, in a moment some uh, basic aspects of 4DN equals 2S CFTs, in particular the symmetry algebra and the relationship between no-potent supercharges and cohomology. And then I'm going to go on to reviewing the identification of, uh, of chi 2D. And I'm hopefully going to do this in such a way, because uh, some of you might already know this part of the story. And my goal is to kind of do this in such a way that um, it makes more apparent uh, why the extended operators have the sort of properties that they end up having. Um, but after we do this in part three, I'm going to um, uh, show you how these uh, extended operators are constructed uh, via the so-called descent procedure, and it will culminate in uh, uh, the presentation of this sort of web of descent operators. And then finally, if I have time, I'm going to show you some uh, partially complete results in the explicit example of, uh, of uh, uh, a free hyper. So we're going to basically construct uh, what these descent operators are in the case of a free hyper, and I'll show you some uh, um, some OPEs for a closed uh, subalgebra of the full vertex algebra. Okay, and I should also add, if there are any questions, please anyone uh, unmute yourselves uh, and feel free to to interrupt and ask. Uh, I very much welcome them. But before I move on, uh, any any questions uh, so far? Okay, so good. The symmetry algebra of a 40n equals 2 uh, SCFT, um, this is a supersymmetric symmetry algebra. So, of course, it uh, can be decomposed into two parts, a bosonic subalgebra and a fermionic subalgebra, where let me just remind you that the bosonic subalgebra uh, is composed of the 40 conformal algebra and an internal U2R symmetry, where the generators of the 40 conformal algebra consist of uh, the translations, the Lorentz boosts and rotations. And then we also have the special conformal transformations, which are sort of dual to the translations. And then uh, finally, we have the dilatations generating scale transformations. And for the U2R symmetry, we typically like to break this up into an SU2R part and a U1R part. And I'm going to take as a basis of the SU2R part the following three generators, where R is a Carton element, R plus is a raising operator, and R minus is a lowering operator. And little r here is going to be the generator of uh, this U1R. And for the fermionic subalgebra, it has a basis of uh, 16 supercharges, which are, are given by uh, Qs, Q twiddles, Ss, and S twiddles, where all of these indices here are uh, fundamental SU2 indices, or in particular, these uh, A indices are SU2R indices, and alpha and alpha dots correspond to um, left handed and right handed uh, uh, Lorentz spin indices. And the kind of only algebraic fact I just want to remind you of is that the anti-commutator of Qs with Q twiddles closes on Ps, and the anti-commutator of Ss with S twiddles closes on Ks. OK. So a very important property of uh, the fermionic subalgebra is that uh, uh, there exist supercharges, T, which are no potent, meaning uh, uh, supercharges which square to 0 based on the symmetry algebra itself. In writing this out, I've adopted this sort of uh, circle symbol, which throughout the talk is going to uh, denote the action of uh, x on y, where if x is a group element, that's going to stand in for the conjugate group action. And if x and y are both Lie algebra elements, that's going to stand in for the anti-commutator or commutator. But if it's never clear from context, again, just please feel free to ask, and I'll clarify. But uh, an example uh, uh, of a, of a no-potent supercharge is actually we already saw a, a, a sort of trivial example on the previous slide because all the basis supercharges that I just showed turn out to be no-potent. But a more non-trivial example comes from uh, the set of so-called twisted shirt supercharges, which are the following linear combinations of Qs with S twiddles, where zeta here is just a complex phase. And uh, it turns out that this is uh, no potent uh, because uh, the anti-commutator of Qs with S twiddles is zero. So uh, uh, this supercharge is actually no potent for uh, any choice of, uh, of, of these indices here. And we're going to see an explicit example of a twisted shear supercharge uh, later in the talk. OK. But due to the existence of these no potent supercharges, it means that there exists a very powerful technique for examining uh, supersymmetric theories which is called working in t-cohomology, or is also known in the literature as uh, twisting the theory with respect to t. Okay. 
So what does it mean to kind of work in T cohomology? Well, there are two consequences. And the first major consequence is that it picks out the set of local operators that we're allowed to work with. And this set contains all the local operators, which are called uh, T closed, meaning they're annihilated by the action of T. And these local operators are not allowed to be T exact. So th that means that they can't be written as T acting on another local operator. And such local operators almost by definition live in what's called the cohomology of T evaluated on the space of local operators, where uh, the cohomology of T is given by the following qu quotient space, where in the numerator, we have everything that's T closed and we mod out by everything that's T exact. And given that this is a quotient space, it means that uh, everything that's T closed is subject to the following equivalence relation which says that if I have two uh, T closed operators, O and o, o prime, they're considered to be equivalent if their difference is something that's T exact, okay? So this is the kind of computational setting that we're always gonna be working within uh, when you're working in, in kind of T cohomology. Everything is sort of only defined up to these uh, potential equivalences between uh, 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 local operators and uh, any, any sort of uh, extended operators as well. Um, but in writing all this out, I've adopted a color scheme that you may have already noticed, but let me just, uh, if, in case you haven't, let me just spell it out explicitly. So throughout the talk, anything that's T exact is going to be colored purple, and uh, anything that's T closed but not exact is going to be colored blue. And again, if it's not clear, uh, please let me know. Okay, so the second major consequence that comes about from working in T cohomology is that uh, it picks out the symmetry generators, which can act on the T closed operators. And the symmetry generators that are allowed to act on the T-closed operators are the ones which are also T-closed, meaning it's the symmetry generators which are annihilated um, um, by T based on uh, the symmetry algebra relations. And together, one can show, just using the Jacobi identity, that indeed uh, 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 the set of T-closed symmetry generators form uh, a subalgebra. Uh, but the main reason for this fact, the main reason uh, that we can only use these symmetry generators when acting on T-closed operators is basically because T-closed symmetry generators are the ones that produce automorphisms of our set of T-closed operators. So they're the transformations that map a T-closed operator back to a T-closed operator, right? But more physically, you can simply view the set of T-closed generators as the ones which form the, the sort of symmetry algebra of, uh, of our T-cohomology theory in the sense that they're the ones that we use to kind of build non-trivial configurations of, of uh, the T-closed operators in space-time. And they're the ones that we therefore use to kind of build uh, correlators of our, of our T-closed operators. Okay. So an important subalgebra of the T-closed symmetry generators uh, are- question about uh, it's Sorry, go ahead. Um, so I had a question about these T-closed symmetry generators. Are you only looking at the symmetry generators of the full theory, which are T-closed, or are you looking at the uh, operators? Uh, um, you know, th there could be generators of uh, something which is not a symmetry in the full theory, but uh, looks like a symmetry in cohomology. So which of the two are you, options are you looking at? So uh, everything, uh, all of the T-closed symmetry generators that uh, we're gonna be working with come from uh, the bona fide symmetry algebra of the full uh, mm -hmm. theory that you have when you're not working in cohomology. Um, uh, so yeah, we're not gonna get, we're not gonna be talking about any additional sort of symmetry transformations that only come about from working in cohomology. All right, yeah, thank you. Good. Um, okay, yeah, so this important subalgebra is the set of T exact symmetry generators. And as the name uh, suggests, the set of T exact symmetry generators are the ones which can be written as uh, T acting on some other symmetry generator, call it X prime. But physically, the T exact symmetry generators are the ones that produce additional symmetry constraints that the T closed operators satisfy. And these additional symmetry constraints take the form of these so-called topological word identities, which say that if I take uh, a T closed operator, and I act on it, which with something that's uh, a T exact, the result is again a T exact operator, which means that in cohomology it's equivalent to zero. So it's very important to remember that uh, these sort of topological word identities, they only hold while we're working in T cohomology. Okay, um, so I'm gonna move on to, to uh, part two. Uh, any, any additional questions? 
Okay, good. So yeah, we're now going to go about, and I'm going to kind of walk us through how we can identify uh, this 2D VOA uh, uh, from the 4D theory. Um, and the way we're going to do this is we're going to uh, work in the cohomology of, very, of a very particular uh, uh, nilpotent supercharge, which I'm going to call T plus, which is the following linear combination of supercharges, and uh, is actually an example of uh, a twisted shear supercharge um, uh, that I showed previously. Okay. So the first consequence uh, is, of course, uh, the set of local operators that we're allowed to work with are picked out. So what are these local operators? Well, these are the so-called sure operators, which again, I'm denoting by O sub S, which just to reiterate, this means that a sure operator is a local operator that's T plus closed and not T plus exact, which means that they constitute good representatives for T plus cohomology classes. And we actually know quite a bit about uh, sure operators. And in particular, we know um, more or less everything about the representation theory, which uh, says that their high uh, weight spin states under their SU2 R representations as well as the two SU2, the two SU2s of their uh, Lorentz spin representations. But some other uh, useful and, and basic facts about sure operators are number one, uh, there exists an infinite number of them in every 40n equals 2 SCFT. And this is nice because it sort of means that whatever subsequent construction or structure that uh, uh, we find in terms of them is going to uh, be a universal construction. But we can actually say a bit more because it turns out that um, there exists a primary Schur operator and every super conformal multiplet, which simply contains a Schur operator. And so this means that we can decompose the full set of Schur operators within a theory um, in terms of all of the primary Schur operators plus all of their del Z uh, descendants. And so you can already kind of see a bit of a 2D structure emerging here because uh, this sort of decomposition of the set of Schur operators is really looks like uh, uh, the sort of uh, 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 kind of a holomorphic uh, 2D conformal multiplet. Um, we'll see it, that this is a uh, kind of no coincidence. Okay, so we're now going to demonstrate the following. We're going to see how working in T plus cohomology implies that the set of Schur operators has the structure of a 2D VOA, and we're going to do this a bit systematically by showing that the set of Schur operators satisfy the following three pro properties, which I'm going to kind of take to define a VOA, but these are really more or less the properties of uh, a chiral 2D CFT. So the first property says that we need to have holomorphic conformal symmetry generated by these three generators, where L minus uh, generates uh, translations in Z, L0 is a Cartan element, and L plus generates special conformal transformations in Z, and they should end up having the following uh, kind of differential action on a local operator. And the second property says that all these local operators uh, need to have uh, mirror morphic correlators in Z, which means that they need to have a chiral weight H, which is the eigenvalue under L naught, and it needs to be either zero or a positive half integer. And uh, additionally, um, all of these local operators need to be z-bar independent, so the del z-bar derivative needs to be zero. And finally, uh, the third property says that there needs to exist a conserved uh, stress tensor that has chiral weight two. And in particular, this means that the modes of uh, what I'm calling T here, this 2D stress tensor, they must generate the geometric action of the symmetry generators of this SL2z. Okay. Okay, good. So uh, we also have our second uh, major consequence from working in T plus cohomology, which is that uh, uh, we're only allowed to use the set of T plus closed symmetry generators. So what are these? So it's a simple computation. Um, and what you find is that uh, there's a 2D conformal subalgebra composed of T closed symmetry generators given by an SO2Z factor and an SO2Z bar hat factor. And importantly, uh, uh, together, these uh, two subalgebras preserve the full VOA plane. And it's easy to see this because um, the generators of SO2Z written in terms of 40 generators are as follows. We have L minus one corresponds to Z translations. O zero is a linear combination of uh, VOA plane rotations uh, with a dilatation and O plus one um, generates special conformal transformations in Z. And crucially, uh, because uh, this SO2Z factor uh, exists, uh, it means we immediately satisfy our first property. Mm -hmm. Now, for the SL2Z bar hats, they have, of course, they generate uh, anti-holomorphic uh, conformal transformations, but they're sort of simultaneously twisted um, by uh, uh, a, a symmetry generator from the SU2R subalgebra. This is going to be really important, uh, 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 and we'll see kind of why it's important in a moment. 
Okay. But let me also uh, briefly mention that the, this SO2Z and SO2Z bar hat, uh, they don't actually constitute the full set of T plus closed symmetry generators because there are additional T plus exact symmetry generators coming from uh, this no potent subalgebra, which I'm going to call M plus, which is composed of these four generators where P plus generates uh, translations in X plus, M plus Z and M plus Z bar generate Lorentz transformations, which kind of mix the directions in the X plus uh, with in, in the X plus direction with those of the VOA plane. And then uh, K plus here uh, generates special conformal transformations in the X minus direction. Okay. And uh, in what follows, insofar as we're trying to identify chi 2D, we're not going to be concerned with these at all, but we will be concerned with them later on because these no potent, this no potent subalgebra plays a very uh, a prominent role in uh, the descent procedure. So for now, you can just forget about them and I'll remind you of what they are uh, when we need them. Okay. So we now have all the ingredients to show that the set of sure operators satisfy our second property. So let me, let's see how this kind of comes about. So first, uh, the property 2.1 is satisfied because uh, it's a simple computation show, given that we know the kind of quantum numbers of a Schur operator, they all have a chiral weight, uh, uh, H, which is given by the eigenvalue of perhaps unsurprisingly this L0 generator. Uh, and it turns out that uh, H is indeed either zero or positive half integer because it can be rewritten as the following linear combination of the quantum numbers of a Schur operator, where D here, J and J twiddle correspond to the Dinkin labels of um, uh, the representation of, a, of the Schur operator, which in our conventions, we always take these to be kind of uh, positive integers. So indeed, H satisfies uh, this crucial property. Okay. But the next thing to notice is that based on the 2D symmetry algebra that I just showed, it implies that we can move Schur operators in the VOA plane uh, using so-called twist translations, where a twist translation says that we take a Schur operator at the origin and we act on it with the symmetry transformation generated by um, the linear combination between L minus one and L minus one hat. And if this symmetry transformation looks a bit weird, let me just remind you that L minus one, this is a Z translation, and uh, L minus one hat is a Z bar translation, but it's coupled with this SG to our lowering transformation. So what this means is that if we want to move a sure operator about the VOA plane, we have to do so uh, by simultaneously, we can only do so by simultaneously performing a uh, SU2R transformation as well, which is generated by this uh, uh, lowering operator. And again, just to remind you, uh, the main reason we have to do this is because it's the twist translations, which are the ones that preserve the T plus cohomology properties of a Schur operator. So uh, in other words, if I instead tried to translate a Schur operator using only PZ and PZ bar, the result would not be something that remains uh, a good cohomology class. So the result would not be T closed, T plus closed any longer. This is kind of the main reason why we have to use these, these twist translations, which are coupled with this uh, SU2R transformation. Okay. But now uh, it turned out that the second property, 2.2, is satisfied because twist translated Schur operators satisfy the following additional symmetry constraint, which says that their del Z bar derivative is zero. And to see why this is true, just note that um, uh, we can rewrite this sort of differential identity as a word identity in the following way. Um, and uh, the way to see that this is zero is because if you recall, I previously told you that whenever I take a T plus closed operator, which a twist translated Schur operator is, and if I act on it with something that's T plus exact, the resulting operator is again T plus exact, which means that it's zero in uh, T plus cohomology. So this is how we get the zero on the right-hand side here. And it's ultimately how we get um, this additional symmetry constraint to be satisfied. But it, it immediately implies that a correlation function of sure operators is gonna be completely independent of their Z-bar insertion points. Then if we combine this result with our property 2.1, it immediately implies that all correlators of Schur operators are going to be meromorphic functions uh, of Z. And so indeed, this satisfies our second property defining a, a, um, a VOA. Okay, so we are missing only one final ingredient, which is our third property, which says that there must exist a Verisaurus stress tensor T. And of course, a necessary condition is that there must exist, exist a Schur operator, which has chiral weight two. And so the question is, can we find such a Schur operator? And happily for us, it turns out that all possible Schur operators are known. And so our task is sort of reduced to one of just consulting the relevant literature, where, for example, you can consult this uh, 
really nice sort of compendium paper. And what you'll find is that if you assume that your 40 theory is local, so there exists a 40 stress energy tensor, it implies that the uh, conserved current corresponding to the SU2R symmetry actually contains a sure operator that has chiral weight two. And in terms of explicit components, it is uh, this component of the SU2R current. So again, it's, it's highest weight in its SU2R, which are these vertical indices, and also highest weight in its SU2 left and SU2 right spins. Okay. But as I mentioned, this is only a necessary condition. So how do we actually know that this corresponds to a bona fide kind of virusaurus stress tensor? And uh, the way we can verify this is that uh, we must show that within T plus cohomology, the modes of this SU2R current must generate the geometric action of uh, the SO2Z, of uh, uh, closed but not exact symmetry generators. And by now, given the kind of plethora of evidence that suggests these VOAs do indeed exist, it's more or less believed uh, that 40 OPEs and superconformal word identities guarantee that this is true. And it can actually be proven uh, in simple cases, although I don't know and I don't believe there's actually a general proof uh, for this, for an arbitrary kind of sure operator. Um, but regardless, uh, 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 this means that uh, indeed there is a sort of uh, uh, a 2D uh, stress tensor, so our third property is satisfied, and we've uh, shown what, we, what we've set out to show in the beginning, which is that the set of sure operators have the structure of a 2D VOA. Okay. So I'm not, not going to move on to the third part. Um, any questions at this point before I, I go on? Uh, are you planning to show some, some examples? Yes. So uh, after I uh, uh, go through this kind of descent procedure illustrating how things how these extended operators are built, I'll show you an explicit example in the case of a free hyper of uh, what these kind of extended operators look like. I'll show you some OPEs as well. But what, what about the, the cases uh, which are physically interesting? Sorry, can you say that again? I didn't. What, what about cases which are physically interesting? Um, so this is the only uh, uh, explicit example that we've actually done any uh, um, explicit computations in. So then uh, what's the problem? I mean, if, if you don't have a physically interesting case, What's the point? Um, well, I think um, much of the sort of kind of algebraic framework that uh, uh, tells us that th th this vertex algebra exists um, should tell us that it should exist in interesting cases. And we are kind of uh, making our way towards um, uh, uh, trying to figure things out in in uh, the, the relevant examples that uh, I think you're uh, more interested in. I, I suppose that, uh, you know, so I, I accept that you are saying that the, the, you establish existence, but in physics, it's not sufficient. Yeah, I, I, I take your point. Uh, although, yeah, we, we just to be to, front. Yeah, we, we just want to have the explicit examples from which we can uh, extract some uh, uh, physical lessons. About, uh, yes. Yes, no, I, I completely agree. Um, yeah, we've been kind of uh, working out some of the nitty gritty, more or less abstract details. And uh, uh, as I said, we're, we're gearing up to, to doing the hard work to, to work things out in, in the, the relevant examples. So that'll have to, I guess, wait for uh, uh, some future work. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for the question no, yeah, for the comment rather. Okay, good. Um, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna go on to, to part three, uh, which um, uh, uh, illustrates this sort of a descent procedure. So let me say a few things about uh, where the descent procedure comes from. So it originates with work uh, from Witten um, uh, in the late eighties and early nineties. And in his situation, he was kind of concerned with fancy things dealing with uh, the topology of like four manifolds and whatnot. And he was also working in a cohomology theory that was a bit different from the T plus cohomology theory. And the sense that all of uh, his translations, uh, translation generators turned out to be uh, exact, which meant that all of the descent operators that uh, he constructed, uh, they didn't really have any dynamics. So they didn't produce any uh, non-trivial correlators. They were always just uh, uh, sort of topological. But what we'll see is that when you apply this in the case of the T plus uh, uh, supercharge, 
the, the synced operators that you get do indeed have uh, non-trivial correlation functions. Um, but before I show you kind of the algebraic mechanics of this, let me just uh, be upfront by saying that the main purpose of the descent procedure is to construct extended operators which live in your T cohomology theory. And we want to construct these extended operators from the local operators that live in T plus co or T cohomology. Okay, so let's see how this works. So uh, the first thing you do is you pick a T plus exact element, which I'm going to call B, and B is going to be any linear combination of, uh, of uh, this uh, no potent subalgebra M plus that we saw earlier. And you also need to pick uh, any operator cohomology class, uh, which I'll uh, denote here by ON, um, where N can be uh, just any n-dimensional uh, uh, T plus uh, closed operator. And uh, it's also important to note that because uh, B is T plus exact, it means there exists a supercharge, which I'll call Q sub B, uh, such that the action of T plus on Q sub B gives me back B. Okay, and this also implies that T plus uh, commutes with B. And the third thing is uh, we're going to assume that B non-trivially transforms the world volume of this uh, T plus cohomology class. Okay. So what we then do is we define a T, what's called a T plus descent operator. And so let me uh, kind of break this up. So we first, we take our, our uh, ON, our n-dimensional uh, uh, T plus closed operator in some fiducial configuration, say, and we act on it with a symmetry transformation generated by, by B. And then we act on that with the supercharged Q sub B. And I claim that uh, D plus satisfies uh, the following. If I act on it with T plus, I get the following boundary term, okay? So let's see how this comes about. And this is gonna be the only part where I kind of uh, ask you to kind of follow along some, some algebra here. So uh, uh, just bear with me for a moment. So first, uh, when we act on D plus with T plus, we wanna move T plus past uh, Q sub B, and we can do this using the Jacobi identity. And that's gonna give us uh, a B uh, because of this anti-commutator uh, up here. And then I have to um, act on it with the supercharges in, in the reversed order. And then to simplify this expression, note that uh, because B is T plus exact, it means I, in the second term, I can move T plus through such that it's acting on ON, but I also told you that ON is annihilated by T plus, right? So that means that this second term just vanishes, okay? And all I'm left with, the is, all I'm left with is the first term. And the first term um, is simply uh, a word identity, which uh, uh, in differential form is equivalent to the action of, uh, of del alpha on this B transformed um, ON operator. And indeed, you know, integrating my parts, you get this boundary term, which I said you, you get, okay? So the next thing is, if we can safely conclude that this boundary term behaves as the zero operator within the full theory, that then means that this descent operator D plus is a new N plus one dimensional operator T plus cohomology class, okay? And uh, the reason that I know it's gonna be N plus one dimensional is because uh, uh, of this previous assumption here, where we assumed that B non-trivially transformed a world volume. And uh, the reason why we need to make this assumption is basically because if you don't assume, uh, assume this, and it could be the case that B is in the isotropy algebra of uh, this ON world volume, the resulting descent operator is typically uh, not well-defined. Um, at least this is uh, kind of what we see in uh, all the examples that we've dealt with. So this is, uh, it seems like it's a good assumption you, you, you need to make. Okay, um, now the question of does this boundary term vanish, it's uh, typically a non-trivial question to answer, but in all the descent operators uh, uh, that we construct today, um, uh, they actually satisfy uh, this property with kind of no, no complications, okay? So the important takeaway uh, from what, what we just showed is the following. Performing T plus descent, it requires two ingredients. First, it requires an M plus dimensional operator T plus cohomology class so that it's annihilated by T plus. And the second ingredient is that you need to, there needs to exist a T plus exact symmetry generator, which non-trivially transforms the world volume of this cohomology class. Okay, and as I said, this is so, the descent operator is uh, kind of well-defined. This is why we require this. Okay. So let's now apply this to the case of a sure operator and see what we get. And the result is that up to uh, T plus equivalence, uh, it turns out that the unique T plus descent operator 
is the one given uh, or the one that's constructed uh, 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 when B is equal to uh, P plus. Okay, and I'm going to call the resulting descent operator L plus, and uh, it takes the following form, which uh, coincides with uh, uh, the previous sort of more general form uh, that I just showed, where this uh, supercharged Q plus is related to P plus through the action of T plus. Okay, and indeed, one can show just working through the algebra that when you act on L plus with T plus, you get this boundary term. And again, you can do a little more work to show that this is going to be zero in, uh, in all correlation functions. Okay. So what we end up learning is that L plus is a well-defined uh, uh, cohomology class for every single sure operator that was in the original VOA. Okay, so now let me uh, tell you some important properties of L plus. The first is that, as we just showed, it lives in our T plus cohomology theory. Two, this is a bit of a, a computation, but you can show that uh, L plus actually has an L0 eigenvalue uh, or a chiral weight, which is equal to the chiral weight of its corresponding Schur operator that, that it's constructed from. Okay. Second is in terms of its geometry, again, it intersects the VOA plane only at the origin. And four, it, its correlation functions are meromorphic. And we can see that this must be true because uh, one implies that uh, uh, this is L plus is a good cohomology class, which means I can perform twist translations on it. And of course, once I do this, uh, a resulting twist translated L plus operator is going to satisfy this uh, word identity, which we know says that its Delzy bar derivative is zero. So again, this uh, in totality, when we combine it with uh, our property two here, implies that a correlation function of any arbitrary number of sure operators or L plus operators is going to uh, depend meromorphically on the resilient insertion points. Okay. So we've now reached a sort of punchline of the talk, which is that when we take all these properties together, they imply that these the set of L plus uh, light-like line operators are behaving as new local operators inserted into the VOA. And given what I've told you so far, it necessarily means that um, the L plus light lines are going to mix with the Schur operators to form a vertex algebra. And the reason why I'm saying vertex algebra here as opposed to vertex operator algebra is because I have not told you if there still remains an operator that we can actually uh, call um, a Virasaurus stress tensor um, uh, for the sort of a uh, full mixed structure. Okay. Okay. So one question that you might be wondering is if uh, this is the end of the story, or can we perform T plus descent again on L plus? And the answer turns out to be no. The result is always trivial, and the easiest way to see this is because. If you recall, I told you that uh, uh, this M plus uh, subalgebra is no potent, meaning that all the, sim all the symmetry generators commuted with one another. So this means that there's simply just no uh, T plus exact symmetry generator left over that will actually move the world volume of L plus. Okay. But it turns out this is not the end of the story because of the following interesting fact, okay, which says that uh, the 2D VOA can also be obtained by working in the cohomology of a completely different no potent supercharge which I'll call T minus. So if we were to go back and identify um, and try to identify chi 2D uh, by working in the cohomology of T minus, you'd find the exact same symmetry structure, um, or the, sorry, the exact same sort of vertex operator algebra structure. It would pick out the Schur operators and you'd be able to run through our whole kind of mini derivation showing that the Schur operators had uh, the structure of the same VOA when you work in T minus cohomology. So what this means is that from their perspective of chi 2D, T plus and T minus, they're completely equivalent. You can't tell them apart. Mm -hmm. Now, one question you would want to then ask uh, is, do uh, uh, the T plus uh, and T minus, do they produce the same descent operators? And it turns out the answer is no. And this is because they actually differ in their exact no potent subalgebras. Okay. So in particular, it turns out that M plus is not T minus exact. What you find is that there's a different no potent subalgebra called M minus, which is uh, uh, which turns out to be T minus exact. And this set of no potent uh, symmetry generators, they generate uh, again translations which are orthogonal to the, not only the VOA plane, but they're also orthogonal to the symmetry transformations of M plus. So um, what this means is the, the commutator of M plus with M minus is generally non trivial. Okay, so. What can we then do? Well, we can then go ahead and apply the T minus descent procedure to a sure operator and see what we get. And what we're going to get is a new uh, line operator. It's going to be a light-like line operator, which I'll call L minus. 
and the world volume of L minus is going to um, uh, uh, gonna uh, sit on the x minus direction in space time. And as we know, uh, sort of by definition, L minus is going to live in T minus cohomology. But the question we really want to ask is, does it also exist in T plus cohomology? And this is sort of the magical result, because the answer is yes. You do find that L minus is T plus closed. But it turned, and, and it's also the case that L minus is not T plus exact. So L minus forms a good cohomology class. Uh, T plus cohomology class. And the reason why I say this is sort of a magical result is because a priori, we really have no good kind of reason for why this should be true. Um, just by looking at the symmetry algebra, it just kind of uh, turns out to be the case. And we sort of um, uh, stumbled upon it uh, serendipitously. Um, um, so yeah, that's kind of why, why we call it a, a bit of a magical result. Um, but it has important consequences. So the main consequence is that it's telling us that we can take T plus closed operators, we can perform T minus descent on them, and we can get new T plus closed operators. Okay, so in particular, this immediately implies that we can actually perform T minus descent on L plus because first, if you recall L plus, it's T plus closed, and the P minus transformation transforms the world volume of L plus non-trivially. And these are precisely the two ingredients we needed to perform T minus descent. Okay. And so when you do this, the result is another, uh, a new T plus closed surface operator, which uh, who has a world volume, which fills the whole X plus minus plane. And the result is the same whether or not you do the reverse order. So I could also have taken L minus and performed T plus descent on it using P plus, and you'd get the same thing. And when you simplify things uh, and write it in terms of a sure operator uh, being transformed uh, uh, from the origin, this is what it looks like. Okay, and then you can then go ahead and verify that the set of L minus and S uh, descent operators also satisfy the other three properties of L plus, which means that indeed, uh, these two sets of descent operators are also behaving like new local operators inserted into the uh, 2D VOA. Okay, so now let me just kind of summarize what we've learned so far. Um, so for any sure operator, we can construct a set of T plus closed extended operators, which I'm illustrating with the sort of following commutative diagram, where the edges of this diagram uh, uh, correspond to performing a descent procedure uh, uh, with respect to either T plus or T minus. And so to be explicit, this is saying that I can take a sure operator, any sure operator in the original 2D VOA, I can construct an O plus line, an O minus line, and a surface operator, okay? And all of the sure operators and the descent operators themselves satisfy these two properties, which say that they have a holomorphic dimension, which is equal to that of the chiral weight of the sure operator. And uh, they also all have mirror morphic correlators and OPEs, which means that they're going to mix together to form a vertex algebra, which lives in the VOA plane. OK. But it turns out this is actually not the whole end of the story, because we can actually perform descent operations in more complicated ways to get new descent operators. And in particular, you can perform descent with, say, um, uh, the, the following M plus three generator or uh, the M, M minus three version of this. Um, and uh, after you, you go through and you work out all of the T plus and T minus cohomological equivalences, um, what you end up getting, at least in the case of a, of a, of a scalar sure operator, is the following uh, full web. And we kind of uh, go through the details of how this web comes about in the paper. Um, uh, and this is what you get. So in addition to what I've already showed, you get these uh, hatted operators, S hat, W hat plus, and W hat minus, where S hat's another surface operator and W hat plus and minus are um, uh, three volume filling operators. And I'm not gonna say anything about these hatted operators in, uh, in the rest of the talk. Um, but let me just mention before going on is that uh, 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 this web, it, it's only true uh, for scalar sure operators and uh, it may change. Um, uh, for sure operators that uh, have non-trivial Lorentz spin. Okay, so I'm going to uh, go on to uh, the kind of last part of the talk. Am I doing okay on time, it looks like? Yeah, um, good. So before I go on to this, are there any questions about uh, the descent operators or anything like, like this that we just went over in the third part?
Okay, good. So yeah, now I'm going to um, show you what all this looks like in the explicit case of a free hypermultiplet. So the sure operators in this case, there's only one, um, uh, kind of one uh, fundamental sure operator, which is given by the highest weight component of, uh, of the scalar. And I'm going to define this uh, highest weight component uh, to be Q sub i, where i here is just an SG2 flavor index. Okay. And it turns out that the entire uh, VOA of a free hyper is strongly generated uh, by QI, which means that any sure operator in this theory can be written as a linear combination of normal order products of Q and its descendants. Okay? And so, for example, another sure operator, and a very important sure operator, is the one that comes from the SG2R current, uh, and which, uh, as I mentioned, gives rise to the Virasaurus stress tensor. And when properly normalized, um, it takes the following form uh, written in terms of, uh, of Q. Okay. And so uh, what I'm going to show you now and what we uh, uh, present in the paper are uh, all the OPEs involving Q, T, and their corresponding L plus and L minus and S descent operators. And the reason we kind of uh, show this, uh, this the OPEs involving uh, this set of, uh, of uh, T plus closed operators is simply because they ended up forming a, a closed subvertex algebra, okay? Okay. So when we look at uh, the OPEs among Q and its corresponding descent operators, this is what we find. All of the OPEs, uh, they all have a, a non-trivial two-point function, which is the leading term, and they can all be um, um, uh, captured by a single coefficient, uh, which is A here, which is always plus or minus one. And uh, this full table illustrates the kind of uh, 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 full set of OPEs here. So you can stare at these things for a long time. Uh, I don't want you to do that. So let me just mention a couple um, uh, important comments. So the most important comment is that, uh, importantly, all the OPEs are indeed meromorphic. So it means that all of this kind of algebraic structure that I just laid out that tells us they should be meromorphic is actually working. So that's just a very nice check to see. The second thing is there, there's some sort of uh, significant kind of technical compl uh, complications that come about when you uh, try to evaluate uh, two-point functions and there exists intersections uh, between the corresponding descent operators in space-time. And this is particularly the case um, uh, for any surface operator, for any surface operator two-point function. And this is the reason why um, the entries for um, a surface operator uh, OPE that has a non-trivial two-point functions are accompanied by this uh, red asterisk. And uh, in the paper, I mean, the way we get around this is we ended up having to uh, sort of perform Euclidean regularization of the of the of the integrals that you have to compute. Um, so we weren't actually able to kind of compute an SS two point function while residing in sort of a Minkowski space in some in some sense. So this is kind of a, a technical detail, and uh, there's some more sort of extended comments on this uh, in, in the paper, which I would invite you to go look at if you're interested. Okay. The next set of OPEs come from um, T and its descent operators with Q and its descent operators. And again, they can all be put in the following universal form where I only have to specify um, uh, this resulting operator that appears on the right-hand side, um, uh, VI. And it turns out that VI is always either Q or one of its descent operators, okay? So one big question that you wanna sort of immediately ask after um, computing this table is, is there an operator which behaves as a new Virasaurus stress tensor, which would mean that the full mixed algebra is actually a vertex operator algebra. And from the table, you can immediately glean that the answer is, uh, well, you can immediately glean that at least for the individual, uh, um, uh, either T or its descent operators, none of them are acting like a stress tensor on their own. And this is uh, because a necessary condition for this would be that this operator uh, appearing uh, uh, on the right-hand side of the OPE, it would have to be equal to the operator uh, YI here. And uh, these entries, which are boxed in red, are precisely where you see uh, this necessary condition failing. So for example, when I look at the OPE between T and say S of Q, you find that it closes not on S of Q, but Q. So this is immediately telling us that T itself is no longer acting like a uh, Virasaurus stress tensor for the full algebra after we insert these descent operators, okay? But we actually find a stronger result, which says that no linear combination of the X, XTs uh, acts like a stress tensor either. And there are some kind of uh, highly improbable ways around this, but again, uh, let me emphasize that they're highly improbable. So 
uh, I kind of believe that the stronger result uh, is robust. Okay, but in conclusion, this means that the vertex algebra among Q, T, and all their descendants is indeed uh, uh, at least a vertex algebra, but not necessarily a vertex operator algebra. Okay. And finally, the last set of OPEs, these are kind of the ugliest to look at, um, but again, uh, kind of uh, somewhat surprisingly, they can actually be put into a universal form, and they're completely specified um, by uh, 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 a coefficient A, which is, can either be plus or minus one, and also by two uh, local operators, which again are always either Q or one of its descent operators. And again, uh, if anyone would like to kind of stare at these tables a little more longer after the talk, I'd be happy to do that with you. But let me just make some, some kind of brief comments, which is that uh, first we find that uh, no linear combination of the XTs actually satisfies uh, the T Virasoro self OPE. And so this is again, consistent with the above conclusions that we just came to. Um, but I should emphasize that we still actually haven't proven that the full VOA, the full vertex algebra is not a VOA because we've only computed a subset of OPEs in the full vertex algebra. So uh, in particular, the story might change once we actually include the full kind of web of descent operators that uh, uh, um, contain uh, these Hatter operators. Okay. I should say these are just very brief comments and we do have more, uh, some extended kind of analysis uh, in, in the paper. So again, I would, would invite you to go take a look at that if you're kind of not satisfied with what I've what I've said here, perhaps. Okay, so now let me just uh, uh, wrap up. So the major takeaway that I, I want you to uh, uh, to have for, for my talk is that uh, this vertex algebra, it's a new and it's a very rich structure and it exists in every 48 equals 2 SCFT. And there are many kind of um, interesting questions to ask about its structure. And in particular, we really want to know what can we say beyond the fact that it's just a vertex algebra. Um, and in particular, one important outstanding question is what could possibly be the generating set of this vertex algebra? Um, and uh, I think we believe that, uh, I mean, we don't believe that this is just true, that um, uh, whatever the answer is to this question, it's going to require a deep understanding of the equivalence relations between these descent operators, which um, is something we're we're still working at. Um, but okay, so what are some next steps in the story? Well, one thing we would like to do is we'd like to compute the descent vertex algebra for a free vector. Uh, this will naturally have some some different properties compared to the free hyper, so it should be an interesting uh, case to compare the free hyper against. And then once we uh, establish uh, the vertex algebra for the free hyper and the free vector, we can then begin computing in uh, some more interesting examples coming from weakly coupled conformal gauge theories. Um, another question is whether or not there exist other extended operators, which in particular, uh, perhaps Wilson and a tough line operators in these weakly coupled conformal gauge theories, which also live in the cohomology theory, the T plus cohomology theory, in the sense that they're also T plus closed. Um, and in particular, if this is true, we then want to ask uh, if these uh, line operators uh, form modules of either the VOA or the descent vertex algebra just as um, the insertion of certain surface operators uh, end up forming modules of, uh, of, uh, of just the VOA. Okay, so this concludes everything. And uh, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any additional questions. And uh, yeah, thanks for your attention. All right, let's thank Mitch. Questions? Uh, maybe I missed this point, but why did you not look at the walls in for the free hyper and the S hat? Yeah, so yeah. the red guys. Yeah, good. So um, uh, basically, uh, the, the hat operators are somewhat much more subtle um, uh, in terms of their properties uh, uh, relative to L minus, L plus, and S. Um, and they're subtle in such a way that uh, the computation of their OPEs and correlators is a bit more difficult. Um, and this essentially okay, so they're they're there, but they're harder to deal with. Yes, they are. They, yes, I think we uh, we do believe that they're there, um, but these 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 subtleties kind of impediments come about because it's um, the descent operators that you get when you uh, perform descent using one of these Lorentz transformations, m plus three or m minus three. Um, 
they just have some sort of quixotic properties that are a little more a little harder to deal with um uh and, and this is basically because um uh yeah okay maybe that's all I'll say, I can say more if you'd like, but if, if that's sufficient, uh, maybe I'll leave it there. We do talk much okay. more about these hatted operators um, uh, in the paper and, and describe their, their properties and all the kind of subtleties associated with uh, whether or not they're well-defined and and, uh, and things like this. Mm. Uh, but uh, we're very much kind of working away at figuring out uh, how these add to the full story. Okay. Um, I I have a question. Um, yeah, yeah, if, yeah. If you uh, look at, uh, let's say, you one with n flavors, um, the, the methods will uh, be applicable in this case. If I just instead of one hyper, one free hyper, I just have n. Uh, but but coupled to a u one field, which in four dimensions, um, also is uh, infrared free. Yeah, I, I I think we I don't see any obvious impediment uh, to computing in such an example. No. Um, so yeah, so so then the uh, at least from the point of view of the the modelized space will be no longer a free a free modelized space. So I'm just wondering what kind of um, Results will be there. But uh, sorry, uh, wasn't the the conformality um, a part of your construction? Yes, it's it's very much a, very much essential to this construction. Yeah, this okay. the vertex algebra does not persist uh, after moving out on the moduli space, um, either the Higgs branch or the Coulomb branch or any mixed branch or anything. And then you don't have to move on the moduli. Yeah. Space. Okay. Okay. But, yeah, but if you take you one with n flavors, I mean, then it's not conformal to start with. Um, so you, you would want to pick a conformal gate to SU2 with four flavors, I guess. Right. That might be one of the, the simplest which, kind of which, one examples. Yeah. Which, uh, which non conformality do you have in mind? I mean, that's uh, the, 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 the classical theory does not have a scale. And um, and then as you go to the infrared, you flow to uh, the, the U and the couples. So um, uh, is this going to be an obstacle? Um, but the, the quantum field theory is not conformal, right? It's not even consistent theory. But uh, yeah, exactly. Where, where is this? Uh, yeah, yeah, you could say a collection. So in, 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 wild words about this but the, if the analysis here was the free hyper i want to hear the answer about what can be done with you one with influence yeah so i i think the what i would say is if if you do have indeed the full uh bona fide um uh, super conformal symmetry algebra which means that this uh, uh, you do have this uh, no potent supercharge T plus, then you can go ahead and go through with this whole construction. I really don't have much to say, um, or really any idea of what might happen if you kind of uh, break that in any way. Um, so. so you're okay with the three hypers, but not with you one with those flavors. Um, if you go up, sorry, did you say if you increase it to just n n free hypers? No, I just um, I, I said flavors, so you oh, just sorry. take a super QED. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think this is uh, if it satisfies, which it does, uh, this this criterion of having of being super conformal, then uh, n equals two super conformal. Then yes. Um, we should be able to construct this uh, 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 with the caveat that it'll be most easy to construct in the cases where uh, constructions of the VOA already exist. Because everything we do, the construction of these descent operators are kind of directly predicated on the existence of the VOA. So if not much is known about that, 
it's going to be pretty difficult to uh, probably say uh, uh, construct anything explicitly in, in more non-trivial examples. Okay, so how, how about SC2 with four flavors? Um, uh, perhaps you shouldn't take my word for it, but I believe the VOA is is known in that case. So I would uh, I would say yeah, uh, we can probably make progress for that for that example. Yeah. I don't have any strong comments either about what the structure might be. We're very much in the uh, infant parts of, of this whole story, trying to figure out um, what additional properties the vertex algebra might have beyond just being a vertex algebra. So um, it, it's kind of wide open as far as like what more might exist, what more structure might exist in, in non-trivial examples. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No. Thanks for the the good questions. Yeah, we're we're really eager to to get our hands dirtier with more non-trivial examples because I, I agree that the 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 just doing things in the case of a free hyper is kind of underwhelming. But it turns out that the structure is still surprisingly sort of intricate and it's uh, not entirely easy to kind of pin down uh, uh, all that's going on in just this this free field case. So. It's kind of one one of the reasons why we started with it and why we spent so much time on it. All right, more questions for Mitch? If not, let's say let's thank him again. And I'll stop the recording. <laughs>